honor to be joined all the way from San Francisco, um, a compelling author, a pediatrician, an entrepreneur, someone who's making a huge difference in the lives of so many children across this country. She is Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, the author of a compelling book called The Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity. Good to see you, doctor. It's very nice to meet you, thank you. Doctor, let me ask you this, this book, your message. You mm -hmm. gave a TED talk back in, it was released in 15. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of reaction and response to it. You wrote this book about adverse childhood um, trauma, if you will. Mm -hmm. What have you seen as a pediatrician? Um, I've seen a lot. Um, I've seen, it, you, the reason I wrote the book is because for many children, folk, kids were being referred to me saying, you know, please, I think they've got ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. He needs Ritalin. Can you put him on some medicine? And uh, as a doctor, when I investigated how early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children, uh, what I found was that for most of the kids I was seeing, Ritalin actually wasn't the right prescription. And it was really a result of um, what they were, their body's normal reaction to the abnormal experiences um, that they were dealing with. Things like domestic violence or having a parent who's mentally ill or substance dependent, these things that are common, but they are really harmful for uh, kids development and well-being. Short and long-term for these children. Yes, that's absolutely right. Talk about right. that, because some of your colleagues have talked about, and they kept referring to your keynote and how you would be the one to be able to explain this, but short-term, there's obvious, well, I shouldn't say obvious, there's certain effects, but long-term, you're talking about heart disease. You're talking about cancer. And that was shocking to me that there's a correlation. There is. Yeah, so I, understanding that when we talk about the effects of early adversity, I think for a lot of us it makes common sense that if you have a rough childhood, you may be more likely to, you know, uh, drink and smoke or mm -hmm. have, you know, end up with depression or other mental health or behavioral conditions. I think the thing about this research from the CDC and Kaiser Permanente showing that high levels of adverse childhood experiences can double your risk for heart disease or stroke or dramatically increase your risk for Alzheimer's, right? That for a lot of folks was like, what? That's not about bad behavior. That is, you know, what is that about? And, and for me as a doctor, it was, it has been a fascinating journey of uncovering how it is that early adversity leads to increased risk of all these different health problems. We are, with our production company, uh, doing a series called Right From The Start, and it's funded by Nicholson and the Terrell Fund and some others. Zero to three. What we're talking about, these traumatic experiences, this toxic stress, as you will, if mm -hmm. you will, zero to three as well. Happens to those children, no? Um, absolutely, and in fact, a lot of people think that, oh, those, you know, my child was too little. He doesn't remember, and therefore it probably didn't affect him. And what we now know is that those earliest years, the zero to three time period, is a time of what we call critical and sensitive periods in brain development where these harmful experiences can have an even greater impact on long-term health and development. During that period? During that period, yes, that's right. And so helping kids have a healthy start right from the beginning is absolutely critical in preventing these long-term effects. In fact, what all of the science is showing us now is that early intervention improves outcomes. So when we start from the very beginning, Right? And really that means starting with parents, raising awareness, having this conversation that having adversity in childhood can lead to an overactive stress response, right? what mm -hmm. we call the toxic stress response, and that can lead to lots of health problems down the line. Um, but you don't have to hand down your adversity to your kids. There's actually a tremendous amount of healing that can happen. And that's what uh, 
I have dedicated my professional life to, and our organization, the Center for Youth Wellness, is really working on raising national awareness and helping clinicians have tools to be able to address toxic stress in children. Is, to what degree is this a national crisis? Oh, this is a public health crisis. Across the United States, we're talking about almost 35 million children at risk for toxic stress. 35 million. That's right. Is it, I wanna get the numbers right. I know there's a report that's coming out uh, next month with more details on this. Is it one out of four or is it close to half? I mean, how many are we talking about? So when we're talking about individuals who have been exposed to at least one adverse childhood experience, uh, we're talking about two thirds of adults. Two thirds of adults. Two thirds of adults. And when we're talking about the number of folks who have ex been exposed to four or more adverse childhood experiences, which is really the, this very high threshold where we see double the risk for heart disease, two and a half times the risk of stroke, triple the risk of chronic lung disease, that's one in eight Americans. So this is not, you know, some small problem that only happens in certain folks or in certain communities. In fact, this research, when it was originally done by the CDC, was done in a middle class community, 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. You know, it's so interesting, um, by the way, the reference is obviously, if you're not following to the Centers for Disease Control. What I'm curious about is, say you're talking about our national political discourse. Mm -hmm discussion of leaders in our nation. I, I, I might have missed this, but I've been doing this for a few years. I've never heard one major political figure talk in detail about any of this. Is it something they don't know about? Well, um, more and more, I think our political leadership is being awakened to this issue. In uh, this June, actually, I was invited and uh, gave testimony at a congressional hearing mm. about the issue of toxic stress when um, uh, the, the issue of separating kids from their caregivers at the border was... Um, As an immigration policy, right. Exactly. This is part of, that is what you are, another example of what you're talking about. Yeah, you, you, so, what we, so what the science shows us, right, is that uh, when we're talking, when stressful or traumatic things happen and they activate a child's stress response, the way that we buffer at the child's stress response is with safe, stable, and nurturing caregiving relationship. Essentially having a loving parent or caregiver yeah. or relative to be able to do that. So when we have kids who are who have gone through adversity, who are coming to our country as refugees because of the trauma that they are leaving, and then we set a policy of separating them from, from their caregivers, we're literally putting their health at risk. And in fact, what we saw was that individuals who were in the Japanese internment camps had double the rate for heart disease. During World War II. Yes, that's right. Double the rate. Double the rate of heart disease. And so at this point, as a nation, we have to understand that um, once we know this science, we can't unknow it. And mm. we must use it to inform our policies. And when we have policies that knowingly inflict physical harm, right, by separating children who are at the peak of vulnerability from their caregivers that can lead to long-term mm. medical risk, it, it, for me, it was critical to be able to speak out at, at the Senate hearing. Dr. I want to thank you for joining us here in New Jersey um, from San Francisco. Your, your message is powerful nationally. Um, it'll be much, very much part of our Right from the Start and Jay initiative. And I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Delta Dental of New Jersey, NJIT, New Jersey Sharing Network, Wells Fargo, and by Englewood Health. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.